Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I have to give a special welcome to my dad who is in the building right now. So thank you so much, Pops, for, for tuning in. Uh, for everybody else, yo, welcome to Create TV, the Documents for Me 2021 screening. Uh, my name is Malcolm. Uh, you will also meet my coworker, Francesca, and you will meet our CEO today to let everybody know the reason why everything is running so smooth is because we have two interns george and jocelyn who are in the background working super hard to uh make sure that everything is running smooth on the tech side so be sure to give them um, a thumb thank you sometime during this event um a little bit about documents for me like what what is documents for me right so documents for me is actually a three-month documentary program where Create TV chooses chooses local uh, community storytellers that have a story, and then we teach them the technical skills to actually make their story, bring their story to life. So you will be seeing a bunch of five to seven minute documentaries. We have about eight of them to show today. Um, we start off with ten participants, but um, things happen, right? So. We will be watching eight five to seven minute documentaries we are going to really display our culture and uh, really display our community out here in San Jose. Every single documentary is it's on it's on uh, local issues or it's on like local cultural things that are specific to San Jose. So I'm very, very proud to actually be able to show these. Everybody worked extremely hard. I'm super proud of everybody. And uh, Documents for Me, it was a documentary program, but now it is literally a family. All right, so thank you for giving me time to speak. I will now would like to pass it to my coworker, uh, Francesca, and uh, she will uh, let you know how things are gonna go today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Malcolm, for that introduction. As Malcolm said, uh, my name is Francesca. I am one of the um, teachers of Document or Me. Um, today, we are going to watch some films and then we will have a Q&A section with our filmmakers um, after the class. Um, I also wanted to give music credits, the music we were listening to, um, and the intro was Morning Routine by Ghost Rifter, Flourish by Purple Cat, Green Tea by Purple Cat, and our ending song will be So It Begins by Ariel Fay. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And with that, I would like to introduce Chad, who is the CEO of Create TV. Hello. Thank you, Malcolm and Francesca. Thank you for everyone joining us today. Um, yes, my name is Chad Johnson. I'm the CEO of Create TV San Jose. Create TV is San Jose's only nonprofit community media center. So we help tell the stories that make our community so special. Um, we do that through producing media for nonprofits on a sliding scale. We teach you courses, how to tell your own story and give you access to equipment and the tools to help you create that media. And then we distribute that content for and about San Jose, like you're watching now, whether you're watching on YouTube, our channels on Comcast Cable, um, or Roku or Apple TV. Anyways, we're also about to open up a unique 18,000 square foot community center called Open San Jose in the heart of downtown for everyone to use, focusing on story, technology, and social justice. So I encourage you to check out our website for more information about our classes, about Open San Jose, and about all the work we do. Um, our programs and services, of course, they can only exist without the support of our community. And if you are so moved by today's amazing stories, which uh, I know you will be, um, we encourage you to support us with a, a tax-deductible contribution. And on that note, I have to really give a special thanks to the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, who believed in this program and in the power of storytelling to foster social change. Thanks to all the participants. You all have worked so hard over this last 12 weeks and I just know you've been through a journey. And so I just wanna say how personally uh, proud I am of the work you've done. And uh, also a big thank you to Malcolm, Francesca and our interns who have done such an outstanding job making this year's program 
so successful. We had more applicants than we ever had. We had 50 applicants for 10 seats for the program this year. And that's part of the, the work we're doing, but it's also in large part to the folks who make this program work. So thanks to them. And of course, thanks to all the staff and our other interns and volunteers at Create TV who are working behind the scenes to make sure that all you're seeing right now um, comes together smoothly. And just because Malcolm called out his folks, I do want to give a shout out. My father, Dale, and my stepmother, Elsa. And it sounds like my sister and her family are watching. LA and Colorado, Documentary Me participants, you're going nationwide. So thanks to them. Thanks to you. Congratulations. And I hope you all enjoy the show. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chad. Um, without further ado, let's let's get into it. Um, actually, before we get into the show, if you uh, if you are chat, uh, everything someone sends, um, there's just a lot of information in there. So there's the the PayPal link if you want to donate. Um, there's also a link to our pamphlet if you would like to read more on all of the documentaries. And then just periodically, uh, any information that you may need, just look back to the chat and then try to look for Jocelyn's name if you want to get any of this information. So um, our very first uh, person coming up that I have the pleasure to introduce, um, actually, actually, uh, she's dear to my heart because she is going through the same program that I went through when I was at San Jose State. Um, she's, uh, we, I, I got in contact with her by contacting a friend that I work with at San Jose State, and um, I'm so blessed that Sharon gave this uh, opportunity to Yeah, and uh, she has a super dope film. So without further ado, I would like to introduce yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. And welcome. Thank you for that intro. Um, uh, just in introducing my film. I hope you guys enjoy. It's called Black Creativity, and it's uh, giving space to the Black creatives in, 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 in the Bay Area, specifically San Jose. And shout out to Asia, who is also one of um, the main voices in this film, and Gatsby and Kenny, of course. and. Um, thank you, all of you, so much. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I would like to begin with the return of the Code Black Creative Production Project, Secret of the Black and Original of the Good. I think. Blackness can be defined in many realms just because its perspectives are already out there on us as black people. Honestly, like, I'm not one to dwell on the past too much when it comes to how we, you know, are treated. I definitely think it becomes, blackness is defined when I'm around other black people in a way where it's like we are in a safe space. This is us. But I definitely think blackness is hard to define with all these different you know outside influences so when you do narrow down to like okay I'm black and you're black you're black you right I sing you know it's just it's just a different light for me like just having that community creativity is everything is it's everything creativity is life itself because you cannot create without observing you know life imitates art so you know art must imitate life and i feel like that goes both ways because every artist that's ever created a piece had a muse you know he didn't just create it like unconsciously you know he may claim to have but at the end of the day like i feel like people could do an investigation to find out like oh the sources or the inspirations behind every piece of art that's ever been made so it's like creativity is is just the art of life you know and the fact that it comes in so many mediums like music like canvas art like it, it the fashion you know is it knows no bounds like i like i said earlier it's just like creativity is just the release of like emotional residue you know on a tangible medium honestly sometimes it's not even tangible you can't even touch some people's creativity sometimes creativity it really is innovation like 
they keep saying innovation, San Jose, you know, Elon Musk, I don't know. But black people really create things out of like nothing. And like, especially black Americans, to be specific to like my culture, like knowing what black people we've gone through in the past, like, like even um, in the topic of like the food that we eat, like when you hear the history of like shrimp and grits or just grits in general or or the things that the things that we created out of like the nothing that they gave us, like that's really like beautiful and like it creates culture, it creates warm feelings. Um, black creativity is fun. Um, <laughs> Just like just seeing black people like make things and like like you we see it now like with culture like people like black Creek people like we create words we create um, dances you know TikToks out there you know doing their thing songs music and people like really just like absorb and they love it they love it and it's just something natural yeah snaps 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 um <laughs> i definitely feel like expressing my blackness as a woman um is critical i'm a very emotional person so i do get down and vulnerable with it and um i think again hitting every crevice is also being vulnerable and like being able to share a struggle which is being a black woman for me um so just my experience itself is how i pay homage because you never know like who can relate and who can feel you and just be inspired to also like you know mm -hmm. find that authentic part of you i am asia i am a singer model writer poet spoken word genie and i am a black creative don't limit yourself i go by jay gatsby my name is formerly jordan melvin uh, my pronouns are he him you know uh, i'm from dreamville north carolina came to california in 2018 and i am a black creative stay black don't ever sacrifice your blackness for some bread, like, because it'll never be worth it. Like, stay black because there are more people watching you than you think. Stay black because, like, there's power in that a whole lot. I am Kenny. Kenny Beats. Sigma. Sigma Beats. And I am a black creative. Yo, shout shout out to shout out to yeah yeah film. Uh, I graduated at San Jose State in like 2014, and like you really make me wish that I was at San Jose State right now because uh, it looks like y'all got it popping. And I would like to say my name is Malcolm, and I am a black creative. <laughs> so shout out to yeah. Let's let's keep it let's keep it moving in the interest of time. I really hope y'all are y'all are typing in some questions. Um, I, I can't like look at everything, but I really hope y'all are, are typing in some questions because we will have a Q&A at the end. So please do not hold back. Please do not hold back. But nonetheless, I'd like to introduce our next film. And uh, this next film is from Jinji. And uh, for some of you that know me, you know I am an audiophile and I love sound. I love music and I love and I love cultural music like drumming. So this this film was actually one of the most educational films that I have ever seen because I did not know that this was going on in my backyard. So I would like to pass the mic to Jinji and let her explain a little bit about her film. Thank you, Malcolm. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jinji, and my documentary is uh, my love letter to the obscure Philippine tradition of Kulin Town. And in order to create this film, I recorded and interviewed my bandmates who I performed with in a group called Kulonzang Dialect. And I do want you to keep in mind that Kulonzang is an entire universe. 
So it's pretty challenging to fit everything about it that makes it so great into five minutes. So think of what you're about to see as a glimpse into the cosmos. And I hope you enjoy. Kulintang music is an indigenous musical tradition practiced mostly in the southern Philippines. It is a pre-Christian, pre-Islamic, basically pre-colonial indigenous tradition. Kulintang music came to the United States through the efforts of one man whose name was Danongan Kalanduyan. And he is often regarded as the father of Kulintang music in the United States. So anybody who plays Kulintang here in the U.S., there's a 99.9% .9 probability that they're playing a song that Danny has gifted to our community here, our Filipino-American community. My first impression of Kulintang music when I heard it, I would say as in my adult years, was a deep connection just like kind of inside my my core like hearing the polyrhythmic patterns and the deep sound of the gongs and the drums i sort of described it as like a thunder inside my chest <laughs> and that's how i think of it you know that that's how i think of danny's gift is he gave me a little bit of that thunder and now it's in my chest favorite part about performing with the band is that feeling when I'm on stage and I'm playing and I'm locked in with my bandmates and I can look around to them and we're all kind of grooving and it's like this experience like I it's hard to explain in words but I forget everything else that's going on all the drama all all the hard work all the what, what's, ha what's for dinner? What's, what time do I have to pick up my kid from soccer? All of those things when I'm playing and when I'm performing and it's a sense of freedom, release, expression, and connection. When we were performing at Kapwa Gardens, there was a group of Lola's who were dancing and they were having fun and for them to have come out just to see us like I was really humbled by that I felt a sense of like gratitude that I was able to bring some joy to them so I didn't grow up with a grandma so seeing other people's grandmas have fun that really brought me joy I'd love to see more like workshops where families could come and learn the instruments as a family um, or as a you know, community and come and, and learn and, and maybe do a little bit more in education. We've only just begun and I think like we have, I mean, it's a whole universe that we can still explore and whole levels of, you know, getting better. And so that's exciting. And my hope is, I have big hopes, but they're simple. My hope is that as a band, that, you know, 
we really hold down the tradition solid but that we can also offer contemporary and original compositions that the community embraces because ultimately that's that's what it is when you play it for people are they dancing are are they enjoying it and so that is that is what i hope to be able to do is be a band that can do both uh, and i think we're well on our way documentary which the rest of them are all going to be awesome as well um, i know we have a q a that we're going to answer at the end but if somebody asked how to find out more information and if you look at the chat if you follow uh cooling kong dialect on instagram you can find out more information and where they perform next also shout out to the homie james who made the documentary i know it's super exciting getting to see yourself in the documentary so shout out to james super famous now all right, nonetheless, we're gonna move it right on. So this next documentary is another one of those documentaries that's just super educational. A lot of times when you, I feel like the South Bay and San Jose is so huge, it's almost like four cities in itself. So sometimes we don't know what's going on on the other side of the city. And we also don't know the access that people have on the other side of the city or the lack of access that people have um, outside of their own, their small communities. So. I would like to introduce Pamela and allow her to let us know what we're about to watch. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Malcolm. My name is Pamela Campos, and I am a San Jose native. Um, so this film is talking about my career as a preschool teacher and working in centers in both San Jose and Sunnyvale, um, and just really across the region. I've uh, witnessed the condition of many of our centers uh, firsthand. And so I know that when you work with kids all day, the physical space under which care is provided is an undeniable element that contributes to the mood of everyone who's in it. So children, educators, they're both very deserving of quality physical environments um, to learn, to grow, and to teach. So my hope is that this video showcases what these quality environments can look like and um, shed light on the kiddos who don't have access to them currently. My dream and my hope that one day that all the children in the state of California, uh, in Santa Clara County, giving an opportunity to explore more and discover more, that you didn't need to go far away, only in your backyard of your school, you can explore and discover more things to improve their, um, their child development. Because I believe the, the spaces that support the teacher, the environment have a great impact on every child's life. 
because if some of them are this is low income children and the children only stay at home watching TV or a lot of gadget they're using but they don't have time to explore when they grow outside. This is my dream come true. Uh, when I graduate from Hispanic University, that I want to work into the center where part of my community and I live in the east side San Jose. And the center where I'm working is in the east side San Jose. And this is the place I feel like I'm so happy coming to work every single day. My future matters. When I grow up, I'm going to be a soccer player. When I grow up, I want to be a police officer. Science tells us that the adolescent brain develops at a rapid rate, providing a window of opportunity similar to that of early childhood. What the young person experiences during this period plays a critical role in shaping their future as an adult. When I walk into the center where I work, I feel welcome and excited because I know that I am part of a resourceful, diverse community. Our environment serves us as a good teacher for the children to be self-guided it gives children opportunities to explore materials in various ways. We have child-sized furniture and equipment that are suitable for children to explore at their level. We also have natural lights and neutral tones elements to support a calm atmosphere and acoustic levels. The classroom layouts allow us to easily supervise children as well at all times. The bathrooms are a little too private where I, once I'm in the bathroom doing diaper changes, I can't see anything that's happening in my classroom. It's a little nerve wracking when I'm like in the bathroom and I can hear the chaos, but I can't see the chaos that's happening. Early care and education is an essential part of our social fabric. The recipe for school readiness includes high quality early care and education for all children. When children enter kindergarten ready to learn, they are more likely to remain in school, stay on track for graduation, and are more likely to pursue post-secondary education or vocational training to successfully transition into adulthood. The demand for high quality early education grew between 2019 and 2020, while the number of slots decreased. In Santa Clara County, more than 17,000 low-income children do not have access to affordable, high-quality childcare. The children of Santa Clara County need leaders they can count on. Who will be our heroes? Alright, alright. Shout out to Pamela. Excellent job. Thank you so much for uh, educating the rest of the community. And um, and I think somebody said that this could be used as a training video for Head Start. Like it is straight up. Like it really, it really could. Um, one thing that uh Pamela's video mentioned was I believe the first lady was uh was talking specifically to the east side of San Jose. You know, we really want to stay on the east side of San Jose, right? And, and when we go into our next documentary. We're just going to dive even deeper into into the community of the East Side. This next this next person, uh, this next documentary is super super dope to me because uh, I'm a car person. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Claudia. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Claudia Tercero, and my project was inspired by this last Cinco de Mayo. After many years, I grew up here, and obviously, if you're from the East Side, you've gone cruising or you've gotten in a low rider and just enjoyed the moment. But as I went now as an adult, a mother, I was harassed by the police, and I thought, oh my gosh, how is this still happening years later? I think the East Side is always portrayed in a very negative nature and especially by the media. So I wanted to really be able to tell a story of all these signs that we continue to always see. I grew up seeing them, but I had no clue why they're only in this area. Because obviously if I go to Willow Glen or the Rose Garden, they're not there. So why are they in my community? Um, and this is where all this curiosity started. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of documentation about the history of King and Story. So it's fascinating to be able to find what I did, and I wanted to be able to hopefully in the future come to a solution of how we can embrace this as a city and as a community, as part of a culture and not have it be so criminalized. So this is my documentary about cruising is not a crime. I often wonder, why is cruising a crime? Living on the east side, you can't help but notice the multiple signs that say no cruising and no stopping anytime. All up and down King and Story Road, there are over 30 signs along the intersection, a few feet away from each other. Why are they there? How long have they been there? Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of documentation on the cruising culture in San Jose. Let me try to make sense on how low riding became a crime. On some Friday and Saturday nights, San Jose's King and Story Roads area resembles a war zone, with police lined up on one side and kids on the other. The youth, mostly Chicano, say they come to socialize, to have a good time with their friends. The police say the kids pelt them with rocks and bottles. Neighbors complain of fights and loud music. Merchants say their businesses are often vandalized and looted. The King and Story area is described as the site of a massive public party on weekends, sometimes lasting until 5 a.m. That party is often interrupted by police barricades, violence, <laughs> sirens, and arrests. The city of San Jose has long been trying to rid itself of the youth gatherings at King and Story Roads on weekends. The kids complain of a severe lack of recreational facilities on the east side and say simply that there is no place else for them to go. There's nothing else to do. Why are you out here? I'm out here just to have a good time and cruise, man. You do this all the time? Yeah, just about every weekend. Once a weekend, you know. How come you guys don't go someplace else? Why start in King? Well, if you go to a park, they chase everybody away. And if we go, you know, like, like to a parking lot, they still chase everybody away. Really club them and everything. But out here, it's going to be harder for them to get us, you know. So we're just out here to have a good time, you know. You don't feel like you're doing anything wrong, right? Do you see anything wrong right now? Nothing. Everybody's having a good time, huh? Low and slow, it's what we know. Music blaring, dope-ass paint jobs, hydraulics swinging side to side. These are cultural works of art, Chicano masterpieces. So where's the crime? Let's get a historian's perspective from Professor Arturo Villarreal, a San Jose native who teaches ethnic studies at Evergreen College. Here in San Jose, uh, you had low riding as early as uh, the 60s for sure. Uh, I spoke with some uh, low riders from the past who mentioned they were cruising back in the 60s. Uh, of course, into the 70s, it, it, it got really big here. And, and in 19, around 1979, late 70s, you know, this was like, this was the place where it was really happening was, uh, you know, King and Story. And it was around soon before that that uh, Whittier Boulevard, uh, the main the main drag uh, main strip in East LA, uh, was closed down, and so there there might be some correlation there. You know that that's closed down, and all of a sudden, you know King and Story uh, surfaces as as like you know the low the new low riding capital, so to speak. Well, I think there was probably already cruising going on there. You know, uh, as I mentioned, as early as the '60s, 
There might have been, you know, like cru cruising low riding before then. I just don't know. But definitely as early as the 60s. And that, that's always been a spot. You know, it's kind of like the uh, the the Nexus, uh, uh, Axis Mundi cultural genocide. You can't kill the people, but you, you can you can um, attempt to kill the culture or, or squash it, right? Or curtail it or, you know, minimize it, right? It is, it's ethnocide. When you see the elimination of, of a cultural practice that's, you know, central to many uh, Chicanas and Chicanos, because keep in mind, Chicanos were also low riding. It's a subculture, right? But, um, and and it's the way this particular subculture showcases its, its particular culture, you know? Will it be around the future? Of course it will. It's it. This is something that, you know, uh, that it's going to be around just like Dia de los Muertos, just like, you know, uh, tamale making ritual, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is, it's going to be, it's just going to take on a different form. Look at them as like innovators, because this is a, this is an innovation that came from Chicanos. Didn't come from, you know, somebody else. It was our invention. Yes, 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 somebody, Francesca said she loved the music. I was about ready to toss it at the end. Yo, that was probably the most sand hole thing I have seen in a long time. So shout out to Claudia for really displaying our culture out here. That That's a film that I want, I want to share with my family on the East Coast so they can really see how we get down in San Jose. So thank you, Claudia. Um, next up is literally like sister my sister from a different mister right um this next one is all about actually you know i'm just gonna let i'm just gonna let her her share it um so i'm just gonna introduce joyelle and just give her a shout out for being very close to me and then not needing any extra support with this with this uh documentary literally just doing it by herself and i learned that she is like amazing at editing so without further ado i want to introduce joyelle Welcome. <laughs> uh, my name is Joyle Haynes, and my documentary is titled Where Are the African Gods? Um, it was inspired by a poem uh, that my dad performed many times, uh, written by Abby Lincoln. Um, this is in the style of, of Keith Haynes, and so we'll get to experience that poem as we go through this process. But the, the general concept of the documentary is to kind of start this conversation with the Black community in San Jose and to kind of check in. Um, as we've had this uh, shifting of the way that we're able to express our culture and um, interacting with San Jose um, and the cultures that already exist and kind of create the, the boundaries that we, that we live in. Where are the African gods? Did they leave us on our journey over here? Where are the African gods? Will we know them when they suddenly appear? My name is Joyelle Hayes. I'm a 26-year-old San Jose native, having started with the Coma Arts Drum and Dance Troupe at 16 years old. I've been an organizer, educator, and entertainer for over a decade. I went away to Philadelphia for school and in search of a richer Black community and came back with a renewed passion only to find Acoma Arts had dissolved. So with the end of an era and huge shoes to fill, Nero, the Black business network and brand management company was born. However, with the sunsetting of Acoma Arts came a massive decline in the visibility of the Black community. So I went on a hunt to reconnect with old friends and community pillars to find out where we are as a people. Hello, my name is Malcolm Lee, Malcolm Lee Halfrom. I'm from San Jose, California. I think the black community in San Jose is real spread out. So, so there isn't a chance for, for there to be like a strong community 
anywhere. Uh, I also feel like it being so diverse, I think the city does a lot to try to funnel people into a um, into a like certain mind state or, or certain culture. It seems like when a uh, when any culture starts bubbling up, San Jose seems to do something to to slow it down. To, uh, they always pour a little bit of water on the fire. They don't want things to get like too hot out here. It seems uh, San Jose is a diverse city and it is it, it, it is culturally diverse. But I think the the culture of the government of the governing forces in San Jose, the culture of it is like tech. So it seems like if anything happens that's uh, not that would scare off tech companies, then San Jose is ready to like, squash that. Because the people out here are racist, undercover racists, and it, it's not blatant, it's not in your face. So if you're not taught this passive aggressive racism, even I call this undercover racism, and you don't know it, you just get pushed along and end up nine times out of ten finding yourself in a bad position. Mm, yeah, I don't think there's any tangible spaces. Uh, not having these tangible spaces doesn't allow for healing, it doesn't allow for us to talk about our stuff. It keeps us um, out of the loop of one another. It separates. Keep, it keeps us separated. I feel like it messes with us mentally. I feel like it makes, it probably makes us angry. I feel like it probably makes us sad. I still felt a overwhelming need for a redemption, freedom. I couldn't really afford to stay after I got out of that Silicon Valley grind. I refused to go back to work, okay, and give them another minute of energy, creativity that I felt like they didn't necessarily deserve when I was working in the Valley. Where? Are the Where? African God? Are the African God? Did they leave us on our journey over here? Where are the African gods? Do we know them when they suddenly appear? The ones dismissed with voodoo, rock and roll, and all that jazz. That jungle, mumbo jumbo, and razzmatazz. Where are the African gods? Who live within the skin, skin without the skin, without the skin, skin, and within the skin again? Where are the Africans? Do they hide among the shadows while we stumble on the way? Or do they go with heaven to prepare another day? Where are the African gods? Who will save us from this misery and shame? Will we see them when we pray in Jesus and Allah's name? Where are the African gods? who live and set us free, we are the African gods. We are you and me. Dude, gang, gang, huh? Gang, gang. All right, that was that was solid. Um, I was in that documentary. You, you, you probably seen a picture of me from like years ago, a little locks, but nonetheless, that was beautiful. Thank you so much, Joy L. This this next person that I would like to introduce. Um, I'm I'm not even gonna lie. This 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 brother right here has an eye for for filming and for getting shots um has an eye for color is is one of the dopest artists i have ever met in my life one of the dopest visual artists i've ever met in my life i'm super duper excited to introduce eric and allow him to introduce his film
Hey, how's it going, guys? My name's uh, Eric Gage, and uh, my documentary is called Endless Canvas. It's about, just like a lot of artists out here in San Jose, but focus on one this time. And uh, he was really, he was really down to, to let me film, and I'm truly really grateful to, to be able to follow him and show you his story of how he's coming from a street artist, from a graffiti writer, to now working like with murals and stuff. So it just shows his journey and the process and some of the obstacles that he that he's overcome. So hope you guys enjoy. What does graffiti mean to me? Man, graffiti means everything to me. I put blood, sweat, and tears down for this craft, and it's like the one thing I think I stayed truly committed to throughout my life, you know, it's always been there. The longs that escape from sometimes depression, built up anger, overall day to day bullshit, it's like that perfect stress reliever. At that exact time and place, Nothing else matters. It's like you're frozen doing what you love. And that's amazing to me. But it also comes with a lot of danger and risk involved. I mean, you risk your, your health, your freedom. It's definitely not all about peace and colors. That's why a lot of people don't last in this game. You fully got to be committed from the streets to freights, state to state. This craft game is like a game of chess. You know, you got to be versatile in all these different aspects. But if you stay true to it, takes you to these crazy, beautiful locations and places that not most get to see. Knowing parts of the city that other people don't even know exist. It's a gift within itself. Being downtown at night, it's beautiful. There's this feel, this energy, it's like, it's almost indescribable. It's like you feel so alive down there. You're an untamed concrete jungle when you're down there late night. It's a trip being out there in a city that's mostly, you know, rustling and bustling. Loud noises everywhere, a little more slowed down at night. Like the cold air just kind of just makes everything just so smoother. The little war always brings me back down there. One thing I think I'll always just want to come and visit and be a part of in some way, somehow. Getting older, it's like you, you still crave it, but like you gotta, you gotta evaluate the risk that's involved with doing the illegal graffiti. So. Sometimes you just you find a spot that's chill. You know I mean, you pay attention to it enough, like you can see if it's busy or not, and if it looks good, then plan something out, you know? I had this time, the owner pulled up, like, when I was halfway done painting it, and then he ended up really liking it, and he wanted me to, to do something in the inside of his business, a real trip, just like, you know, people really do appreciate it. Now, nowadays, I try to incorporate more cartoonish or like you know more more street friendly things that kind of will the city will let rock and even like the, the owners of the buildings like if they see it like you know kind of like compliments it being a writer means you always have to learn how to adapt you know to each, each situation and it's just another form of adapting with the art you know starting to get paid for it instead of getting in trouble the problem that comes with that though is as a graffiti writer I always just grew up just like Always being told, you know, you gotta hide your identity, you gotta keep it low key. Which in sense means pretty much, you know, hiding your talent, hiding your uh, your art form. I'm still trying to manage maneuvering through the transition of graffiti writer to more legit and uh, legal, people mirrorless. But at the end of the day, it's not even about the money. Sometimes you just get the urge to like create, you know, it's always that. I like itch to, to just produce something. I mostly now try to go after walls that are kind of everyone's just dissing everyone. It's a whole bunch of just like, just tagging, you know? So I want to give a proper representation. I love giving back to my city, man, and doing these murals out here. I mean, sometimes these businesses can't afford it or be getting uh, torn down soon. So they kind of give us free reign to do like whatever we want. And being out there, interacting with the community, like everyone loves it. They, they love the art form. They always say, they'll, I hate that, that tagging part, but I mean, without tagging, it's like it's all, you all start from somewhere, you know? So without that tagging, we'll be able to like get these skills uh, to produce the work now. 
So it's an ever, ever evolving culture that I think uh, I'll always be a part of. I love it. My advice for all the other talented writers out there, just, just get out there, put yourself out there, connect with people, there's opportunities, you never know. Make them see how. Get out there, hit the streets, put paint where it ain't. You never know. The world's an endless canvas. All right, all right. Shout out Eric. I don't know if y'all saw that. Uh, if if y'all saw that very first scene where he, uh, you know, spray painted over, and then we saw endless canvas. That was cold. That was cold. And uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Chad. He spray painted over one of our uh, uh, one of our iPads, but it was in the name of art. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He has some secret way to do that. But nonetheless, I want to introduce our next participant. Um, I will say that this this participant. Like Chad said, we had like 50 people that applied and we only had like 10 spots. So we actually had to do some interview processes. And I'll say after the first interview, Francesca and myself literally fell in love with this participant. And then we also have deadlines for our participants to meet, for, for them to hit while we were going through the program. And um, Natasha hit every single deadline, like even even earlier than, than we needed. Uh, she worked super duper hard. Um, up until the last minute just to keep perfecting her piece. I'm very excited. And it was another one of those pieces where it's about a spot that is literally I walked by every day going to school, going to college, and I just didn't even know it existed. So let's learn a little bit more about um, our city. And I would like to introduce Natasha. Hi. Um, we Cafe, San Jose, California is like a place for homelessness, mental health, or those struggling with addiction, or those who just want, get, want some counseling. But I was trying to put it in the framework of being homeless and going to Recovery Cafe, what it's like, what it could be like in an interview. And it's, it's sweet, nice, and I just want to say that um, Tagashi Ogashi rocks. And um, we'll take it away, you guys. <laughs> Place where they could feel heard, seen, and loved. 
At Recovery Cafe, we like to focus on something that we call radical hospitality. We want to provide our members with five-star experiences whenever they enter the cafe. And that starts from knowing their preferred name once they enter the cafe. We also have pictures of our members all around the cafe. Do you get a software? What? Do they give you software? Yes, they give you software. They give us... Who, who, have, who got that job? Who, how did you get this job? How did you, you apply or how did you get it? Oftentimes we talk about in the LGBTQ community the difference between a biological family and a chosen family. And that is the same here at Recovery Cafe as well. Oftentimes this family at the cafe is their chosen family and we provide them a very warm and welcoming environment. If you're interested in joining Recovery Cafe, feel free to join our new member orientation that takes place every Mondays from 10.30 until 11.30. There's no need for any kind of appointment. Super informative. Uh, I was that was one of those videos where I'm a better person after watching it, right? I'm more educated and a better person after watching that video. So shout out to Natasha. Um, we have one more to go. I see um, a lot of people typing um, some typing questions into the chat. We do have a Q and A function for you to type some more questions into. I also think I've seen somebody who said that they were not seeing the video. Um, if anybody else is having trouble seeing the video, please let us know. Please just type it into the chat. Um, we really hope that y'all are seeing these videos and uh, all that good stuff. So nonetheless, this next person that I would like to uh, welcome, you know what I'm saying, to the, to the spot, you know, is a condemned poet, you know, so we're out here representing, letting everybody know what it is, huh? All right, so I would like to welcome this dude, and I'll tell you, as soon, as soon as we started shooting, really as soon as we started teaching classes before we even thought like shooting, he was already like, yo, when can I shoot? Can I get a camera? I'm ready to shoot. I got this lined up. I got that lined up. I got that lined up. And please stay tuned with everybody because although these documentaries are really short, most of our participants have footage to do like a full 30 minute documentary, which we are going to encourage them to do afterwards. So nonetheless, I want to introduce my brother, my main man, Andrew. Right on, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Drew Perez, and um, I just want to give a special thanks to Create TV, um, all the staff. Um, special thanks to uh, Sammy Glenn, Samantha Glenn. So um, my story is, I have a, some of my story is I, I've been incarcerated and I've dealt with addiction firsthand. And being behind the walls, I actually learned um, that there's some really amazing artists that are behind the walls. And I've heard some horrific, tragic stories as well. Um, so this documentary basically is gonna be showcasing prison art, poetry, uh, capture some raw stories behind it and just um, bring community. So I hope everybody enjoys it. And thank you very much. All this art is was made from behind the walls in prison. That's real skill right there. Uh, some acid stuff on them? Yeah, those are bad. Yeah. 
It was actually done on a mattress. So the, 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 the artist used the, the prison mattress as a canvas, actually. <laughs> the necklaces are made out of playing cards, and they were actually wax. And then Poets is a movement for empowerment, it's a movement for self-discovery, to showcase art, poetry, talent, stories, create healing, because we get stereotyped a lot, you know, pe pe people look at us and they want to judge us, but you don't know the backstory. I've seen a lot of people draw on mattresses, and I'm just glad that people still do art. They use their, their struggles as canvas, pretty much. That's what they use as canvas. This is their freedom, this is their release. It's where it goes when just everything else is drowned out. You know? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just trying to lead it. Lead the next generation. You feel me? I'm trying to lead it, man. I'm on, I'm on a positive way. You know what I'm saying? Way, man. Rock with it. I don't think it's going to be as bad as my toe didn't hurt as much. The, I don't neck, the, neck, the side of the neck ain't terrible. And like yeah. I said, I moved pretty quick. Yeah. It really only hurt when I got close to the bone on my, yeah. on my jaw. That was good. My name is Michael Dollarhide. I'm a condemned poet and my art is spoken word poetry. So when I first started writing poetry, I found it inside the walls of uh, prison. I could sit there in my little box with nothing else going on around me and write. I learned it a uh, young age that I can't trust anybody, that the ones that say they love me are probably the ones that are going to hurt me the first. And as a child, I suffered through every kind of abuse that a child can go through. It shaped my world. I got introduced into injecting methamphetamine. The first time I went to prison, I was first on vehicle in high speed chase. So altogether, I've done almost eight years incarcerated. I started writing this letter to my dad, expressing, you know, like, how dare you leave me here to endure all this? What am I supposed to do? It ended up turning into a letter to God. So my poetry has always been my escape, my form of therapy. It's a freedom. More than anything, it's a freedom. Where I find I'm at today with my poetry, it's the rebirth of who I am. It went from just dark, depressed, angry, scream session to a love story. In my slumber, within the depths of the darkness, not even the slightest light can be seen, let alone felt. Felt by what? For in this place, such things do not exist. Eternal agony is close that I will get. It wasn't always this way. Fate memories shift in, but they will always be devoured by the hunger of the beast. For it is never satisfied. No matter how much of my blood I give it. The poison I mix with my blood to feed it only makes the appetite grow more fierce. With every shot he grows stronger. And I get weaker until all my veins finally collapse along with my spirit and I have nothing left to give. I rise. I awaken from my death, born again into his freedom. This love has pulled me from the pits. A love like this I've never known. He stands beside me, willing to take my place. And then I hear the beast roaring as he dies. And I finally understand for my blood could only feed the beast. But the blood of Christ, it has set my spirit free. My name is Daniel Perez. I'm a condemned poet and an artist. Drawing takes me out of this place. Like, I zone everything out. When I was in jail, I'll go and sit there and I'll just draw. The mattress covering, it picks up the pencil lead real easily. I was deeply involved with gangs. It was like my sort of family. I was in youth authorities for seven years. 
CYA is worse than prison. Like you, that's where you learn how to fight. They call it gladiator school. Total jail time, I've done 13 years altogether. Now I'm trying to get my life back together. Can't even for my daughter and for my mama. So um, when I first seen my daughter, I ain't seen her for like almost two years. I could do no wrong in my daughter's eyes. When I show my daughter my, my artwork, I really want her to know is that um, there's a different part of me that, that can do good. Putting my art out there just to be a better person. These condemned poets. Yeah, my goal is for people in the community look at us not as people that are trying to do bad, but people that are trying to change. What condemned poets is, is we're trying to get people that are in jail out of that life to bring them into a more positive life. They want something to fight for, for like a family. Condemned poets will be their family. Demons trying to get this right before I leave and I'm not breathing. I know I made mistakes, but they all happen for a reason. My life it had no meaning. I was really out here feeling. My mind had almost slipped away. It felt like I was dreaming. Daily I still feel the pain, like my soul is bleeding. I put away my selfish ways so I could bring the team in. We elevate the change so we can prosper through each season. GOD the general. I live my life to please him. You steady out here sinning though, trying to bring some cheese in. I motivate the youth with truth, hoping I could lead them on the righteous path with someone that. fire absolute fire um yeah shout out to um shout out to the homegirl sammy for helping helping andrew as well uh if you notice that uh if you notice that when we uh when we first started shooting uh sharing our rough cuts we we're looking at andrews and we're like bro you got two camera angles right like what's what's going on man yeah what's, what's what's happening so um shout out to sammy is that sammy right there Hey, shout out, Sammy. Thank, thank you so much because this this thing was fire, and we all we all need that push or that that help. So just shout out to everybody that was in the background helping all of our participants. Right, I want to like shout out to Henry for the, all the work that he did with Natasha as well, and uh, just anybody else that's that's in your ear that's like pushing you to do this. Like they're supporting. Just shout out to everybody. So that is the end of all of the screenings and um i love it when we're on and i love it when we end early because then that means that i could talk longer and i could talk more and i have to rush myself so but uh, nonetheless before i actually say that we're at the end um and i take up all the time all the air time uh we want to move into the q a to give y'all some air time to ask questions so we have a couple questions that uh, were already asked that we'll post to our participants, and please put some ask some more questions if you if you do so, please. Nonetheless, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Francesca, and uh, she'll explain a more about the Q and A portion. I just want to say congratulations to all of our participants and filmmakers. Um, you could really tell all of your hard work that you put into these films and all of the love that you have for, for your community. Um, so I wanted to just go over again the Q&A. Um, if you have questions for our filmmakers, please put, um, please type them into the Q&A box. Um, if the Q&A, if you're having trouble with the Q&A box, you can also type them into the chat. Uh, Malcolm and I will be reading the, the questions to the participants um, and we'll have them come on, bring, turn their videos on to um, answer some of the questions. Um, and to get it started off, um, I have a question from Shauna that is for all of the participants, um, which is, what was your favorite part of making your documentary? Um, and we can go ahead and do this popcorn style. Um, in class, we would typically like have icebreakers. We would always do popcorn style, which is where you just say the next person's name. So um, does anyone want to volunteer to go first? Or should I pick someone? Pick someone. All right, I will pick Gingy. Sorry, I didn't know I was muted. Um, yeah, there's a lot, but I think like when I got near the end 
uh, of the editing process and I realized what the final narrative was going to be. Um, that was like a really emotional moment for, for me. And I think through this process, I like really understand what people talk, what people mean when they talk about the magic of like making a film or making a movie. Um, so yeah, that's what I enjoyed most about it. And I will popcorn it to Joyelle. Um, yeah, my the favorite part of this process for me was just the community of it all because I was able to get in to the room with a bunch of people who I haven't seen in a long time or who I just love being around. So that was fun. Um, but also like the community through Create TV and like my class and and everybody who is now a part of this network that I feel like um, I can I can hit up at any point and be like, hey, um, we're trying to do this or you know and and my my uh, my umbrella has stretched a little bit and I have some some new family under it. So that was easily my favorite part. Um, I'm going to popcorn it to Claudia. Yes, definitely. Well said, Joelle, because I feel the same way. It's been an extended um, time to meet new people that I didn't think, you know, I'd really enjoy and make it easier every Saturday. Um, my favorite part, I think, was being able to learn. It, this isn't really a culture that I know a lot about, even though it's been around. It's not like my family members or anything. So trying to find the history and really, because I'm such a nerd, just learning the history of it was, I think, the most interesting part to me. And I will popcorn it over to Andrew. Uh, for myself, I would say it was a uh, one of the the my favorite parts was working with um, I guess the interviewees doing the April. You know, I think it was a very uh, we actually captured a lot more footage than um, you know the the seven minutes. So I think just being around people who are being vulnerable and sharing their stories was really priceless. I learned a lot from it and it was just really emotional, you know, just riding the wave with whoever was telling their story. So um, another great piece, I think I really enjoyed the classes because that's where we learned, brainstormed together and kind of like, you know, helped each other out. So um, I will popcorn it to Natasha. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Okay, well, the best part was is that there's this guy named Dean. He's blind, but he's very, very, he's like my um, my secret best friend, um, my secret brother. I um, I took a photo of him, and it was really cool because that he made me, he cheered me up during my times of Recover Cafe. He'd be like, dude, Recover Cafe, Dean's here, yay! So, um... I'm really glad I got to take a picture of this guy named Dean. Yeah. And I'll popcorn it to Eric. It's a, um... <laughs> I'll just say my favorite part was just being able to like tag along with my boys and then then taking me to all these cool little spots around the city is was, was really dope. It brought me back like back in the day. It's all we used to do together. So it was cool to just, you know, be a part of that again and, and capture some some dope um art. Um I popcorn it to Pamela. Hmm. Um, I would say my favorite part is just uh, like so many other people's, the community uh, from the BMM cohort and getting to be a part of like the process of everyone's film. So like the fact that we had our uh, rough cut showcase and then our fine cut showcase so that we could kind of see what everyone was working on and like be inspired, but then all, you know, have their feedback too on, on their thoughts as, as a viewer. I feel like as the person working on the story, you, like you have a vision and hearing like how your vision is translating and if other people are picking up the message is super 
super helpful. So I hope that we can all have some in-person meetings next year. Um, was I the last one? No. Uh, yeah, I think. Hello, um, combination of two things for me, uh, looking at everybody's pieces and ideas and also um, just being able to have a conversation uh, with the people I was interviewing. That's, that was one of the best parts. All right, thank you everyone for your responses. I have another um, question for all of you. Um, this one is from Gloria. Um, can you discuss the impact uh, of doing the film in your personal lives and what you see as next steps? Um, and I will go ahead, I'm going to pick someone at random and I'm going to pick Claudia and we'll do it popcorn style again. Um, I think for me, the next steps would, what was the first part of that? <laughs> <laughs> it is a two-part question. Um, the first part of the question was, um, what was the impact of doing the film in your personal life? Well, the impact was it took a lot of my time and I didn't even think it would so much because I thought, okay, well, I can't really film a lot of things, but just finding the information became more time consuming than I thought. And obviously as a newbie, I didn't think editing would take so long and try to put things together it becomes a big old puzzle. So I thought, okay, this wasn't as easy as I thought. Um, but I think now I'm able to understand that it was a journey to see it from beginning to end. And I also, my next steps would be trying to figure out how is there a solution or where do we embrace the low writing culture as something that's part of the community and not a crime. And so my friend's running for, actually for this district. So if you're in the East side, make sure you vote for Peter. Um, and those are conversations I'm even having with him. Like how do we bring back our Cinco de Mayo parade? How do we ensure we can create spaces where people are able to enjoy me? What else are you supposed to do with the 64 Impala? It just can't sit there. You wanna put music and drive it and enjoy it. So. Those are hopefully next steps I could do. Um, I will pass it over to Joel. Popcorn it over to you. All right. Um, so the impact on my personal life, um, I definitely appreciate Claudia, Claudia for speaking to the, the amount of time, the time commitment. Um, and I think that was probably the, the main personal uh, uh, impact other than obviously pulling a community back in, uh, which we spoke to a little bit earlier, but um, that was the personal impact. Um, and next steps for me, uh, I caught the bug y'all like this, this really created a new uh, brain wrinkle for me. And um, I'm, I'm looking to create more and continue this conversation. Um, we're organizing uh, all the time. And, and if you need more information about that, feel free to, to hit up the Instagram, um, Nero Bay Area, and hopefully you'll, you'll be able to tune in for more films. Um, I'm gonna popcorn it to Yaya. Hello, um, personal impact for me, I was able to be a part of the community that I wouldn't happen if it wasn't for this documentary. So that was one of the biggest things for me. Um, and going forward, uh, just highlighting that community more. And um, yeah, that, that would be it. Uh, popcorn over to Pamela. Thank you. Um, I, I definitely also agree to the time commitment and the editing. Like I had made videos before in the past um, for my family, little things. Um, but it's been so long that I forgot how like trying to edit one minute could take an hour or two. Um, so definitely a time commitment to make these videos, but um, it is fun. It's a lot of fun. And uh, in terms of like my filmmaking future, I have a project that I want to work on with um, my sister. We're going on a trip to Mexico uh, next week and we're gonna visit some of our grandparents and I would love to be able to interview them and kind of get some of their history. Um, 
and, and turn it into a, a movie that I can share with my family and um, kind of have something that, you know, even as people um, leave us, leave this planet, we can still hold on to those memories and, and their voices because, you know, in the past, film filming and videos weren't really a thing, but now that we have this form, um, I really want to use it uh, to hold on to those precious moments. And um, who else have we heard from? Andrew yet? I'm going to pass one over to Andrew. Um, as far as the uh... The future, I would say that uh, we're having a conversation about uh, maybe producing like a series and, and, and uh, using Create TV among other platforms to, I guess, showcase it, as well as uh, a 45. We actually wanted to work on a 45 minute documentary. Um, the, a lot of the subjects that we are the interviewees that we had, we had 45 minute hour interviews. So we thought there was a lot of good. Um, story that we left out so just kind of have like a more full version of that um so super excited about that i'll say the the personal impact um i just think it's amazing to be a part of um other people's stories and, and just creating a platform for other people to, to you know share their their art and their, their stories and, and struggles and successes and you know um so yeah do you want to say anything no? okay all right, so I will popcorn it to, how about, let's go, who hasn't went yet? Um, Jinji. Thank you. Um, so my personal life, um, because I was interviewing my bandmates, uh, we've actually only been together for like a very short time, like only over like the course of like a couple months over the summer. So I didn't really, you know, know so much about the background and interviewing them, getting to know more about like their motivations for pursuing this music and why they wanted to uh, join the band brought me closer to them. And also kind of like echoing what Andrew said about like, you know, feeling like you're more like um, connected to other people. And also like, uh, I feel like more stronger in like my storytelling uh, my storytelling uh, skills, and so I want to use that to make sure more attention to my community as well. Is that everyone? I believe Natasha has not on yet. Oh, uh, Natasha. You guys can hear me? Okay. Um, in my personal struggles were like, I didn't advertise it completely. Like we're doing a documentary, we, we create TV. I didn't advertise it enough to recover cafe. I was kind of hiding because um, I lack self-esteem maybe, but anyways, it was like, a, I didn't advertise it. Yeah, I just totally went. And I just, I just did it undercover. Like people were like doing things and like, I'm bringing it up, but take a picture, take a picture. I didn't, I didn't tell people exactly. And um, I guess by doing that, it gave it a little bit of a seclusion. And um, like maybe next time you should have a voice and say, hey guys, I'm doing this. Who wants to be in a photograph? Because I was like being shy and. Um, so I guess in the next, in my next processes, I don't know. Um, I guess I I need to feel confident and powerful about the decisions making in the decisions makings of um of filming, and learning pre Premiere Rush. That that was difficult. Um, because I got to erase some things. I made something. I erased it. I clicked the the go back button and it didn't work. I'm like, oh no. So um, everything, um, learning learning the Premiere Rush is like something. Okay. All right, did anybody not have a chance to, to answer the question? I think we got everyone. 
All right. As the as the participants um, have kind of alluded to, um, filmmaking does take a lot of time, and it also takes like kind of an incredible complex set of skills. So I just really want to commend everyone for um, you know putting in the time and the effort. And for many of our participants, um, this was their first time making a film, or they were just getting started. So being able to create a five minute documentary in 12 weeks is an incredible feat. Um, I have a background in film and digital media. That's what I studied in college. And I really tried to pack four years of, of film school into 12 weeks. So I just wanna thank everyone for their, their hard work. Um, and I do have a, another question for you all. Um, this one comes from Keith. Um, Keith asks, how are you a better person or artist for completing this project? And I'm going to pick someone. I'm going to pick Joyelle. Um, if that feels appropriate, uh, given that this is my dad asking the question. Uh, but I think that I'm a, I think that I'm a better person um, for, for multiple reasons. The first being that um, I have a different set of lenses that I'm looking through now. Um, it's, it's like I said, I caught the bug with this one and I, and I say that because it's, it's infiltrated every aspect of my life. And I can't, I can't watch TV the same way. I can't listen to music on the radio. I cannot consume media the same way. So I feel like um, I have a more uh, critical eye um, and I have a more um, artistic approach to the way that I walk around the world. I, I look at everything now and, and say, hey, is there a story here? Um, and so, so uh, I think that I'm a better artist for that. And I'm definitely a better person because I feel like having explored um, so deeply into the black community, it kind of um, has created this, this existence where I can see the parallels between my community and the communities around me. Um, and a lot of this, like sharing this process with the other uh, communities that are represented in our cohort, um, has given a chance for them to speak their perspective to what I was, my vision was for the for the documentary. So, that being said, I'm gonna popcorn it over to. Uh, let's go with Eric. I think uh, the filming process made me a better person through just. Uh, understanding like the, the walks of art and what the challenges that people go through the, to get their art seen and, and heard out there. So definitely like a, a new understanding for for uh, everyone that's doing that. So that's it. Um, like a pop point to, I think uh, we'll do Andrew. Um. So the question was, how am I a better person after the, the project? For myself, um, it was definitely an experience um, that I enjoyed. Of course, um, there was some, some struggle uh, with it, but I don't know. I just I feel empowered by just you know going through the whole course and then coming with, with the finished uh, film after and just, I don't know, really opened my eyes to not only um, what we as individuals are capable, like just to put our piece out in the world, make sure that, that we have good material to put out, but also um, I really, it was like, I learned a lot through everybody we interviewed. You know, there seemed like a common theme um, with all the interviewees that, you know, some type of um, abuse that went on as a child, right? So it was a really a learning experience for me um, that, you know, it's more common than that, so. Okay, I will pass it to Pamela. Um, I think how this is making a better person is like yeah. one, um, within the cohort and seeing like the different group of people, the different perspectives, experiences, and interests. Um, it's reminded me to be a well-rounded person and to be able to um, appreciate, you know, things that maybe I, I 
don't use or didn't heard of or I'm mean, inexperienced with, but because they impact other people's lives. And I mean, those things are important too. Um, is what, what helps one member of our community helps our entire community as a whole. So I think that that is how um, this program helped remind me and open my eyes, especially during the pandemic when we've been kind of closed off um, and maybe not out in the world as, as much as we used to be, like being reminded of the stories of the people in our community uh, was really helpful. So I will help turn it to, um, have we heard from Benji on this one? Thank you, Pamela. Um, so making this documentary made me a better person and artist just because it definitely made me feel a lot more connected to my culture. And within like, you know, anything that I write or any art that I create, my identity is like a first generation Filipino American woman. That's something that I bring into a lot of those things. And so, you know, making this documentary and seeing how, you know, other people have responded to it in my community has just made me, you know, like found that flame even more and inspired me to keep doing uh, what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, Claudia, did you go already? No. Um, I think I've never considered myself an artist, but I was excited to be able to bring a vision, a life that I had. And I think as a better person, I think I'm constantly questioning, even in school, I'm constantly questioning what we learn. Um, is it an overall perspective of people that look like me, or is it just the white scholarly people telling us what's right, what's wrong, what's appropriate, what's not? Even today, and we're in my hoops, I'm like, you know, um, professionally, you're always told to wear like pearls, but as a Latina, we like our hoops. That's how we roll. So I'm always trying to challenge the way things are, these signs eventually. Um, I think it's important to have conversations in our communities of why certain things are there. We shouldn't just always allow things to be just because they are, but challenge the systems that create all these things that suppress our community. And so as a person of color, a person from the East side, um, I'm usually not what people think of the East side and I'm constantly making sure that we showcase who we are as a person, as a community. Um, I was born in Mexico, I came here as a kid. And so being able to create things that start conversations hopefully are very important to me. And so I think that's what helped me become a better person and also learning. I've been telling people about all these documentaries for weeks now and so I'm excited to continue to support all of you guys and everything that we're able to learn here. So I will pass it over to Didi Diago. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I don't know about how I've become a better person, but I do know what I learned. Um, I kind of learned uh, or was assured how art could be a tool to educate people and um, to become an activist to write an activist for your community. So that was one of the huge things for me. Um, I think I'm the last one. I believe Natasha still needs to go. Okay. Okay. Um, when Tadashi Ogushi talked about radical hospitality, I was thinking, okay, so everybody is accepted here. And like, what is it to have a heart, a soul, a mind, you know, all these, um, like a, a soul and, um, to, to live with, to live through Recovery Cafe and having an experience with documentary, create TV. It's like, um, it makes me want to like investigate social media, um, videos like YouTube, Instagram, check out um, Facebook, try out their applications, see, experiment more with social media and see what I can do in uh, my, um, to just be a better online person. And um, with this, I wanna go to summer camp because um, 
Some accounts are cool. So having been to Recovery Cafe, because Recovery Cafe has open mics and um and winter holiday parties and health fairs. It's so cool. I like to for me to say that um summer camp because <laughs> because um summer camps can have like a prom effect, a prom effect, like a super cool dance, dance music, raves, and fire posture is painting. Summer camp. So um Pray TV is like saying, I want to go delete of summer camp and see what's gonna happen next. Yeah. Is there anybody left? I think that was everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we've gotten a ton of questions in the chat and that's super exciting. Um, we are not going to have time to get to your questions, but please know that um, we're just super appreciative um, of your questions and we're so glad that um, you're wanting to have this conversation with us today. Um, I did want to ask um, Jinji, there's a question for you, um, and it is about, it is from James, and the question is, what was your method slash process for developing your captions? As an access designer interested in developing equitable experiences, I would really love to hear about how you were thinking about how nuanced culture and accessibility were in dialogue. Yes, thank you for that question, great question. Um, so during one of our classes, we actually watched a short film by a deaf artist named Christine Sun Kim. And I was really inspired by how she wrote her captions. I remember one of the things she wrote is, for example, stars having a conversation. And I thought that was really beautiful and poetic. And I wanted to incorporate that into my captions as well. And I think that, you know, doing like experimental sort of poetic captions like that, it contributes like making it as much of a multi-sensory experience as possible for those people who do have auditory impairments. So that's uh, sort of like what I modeled my captions on. Thank you so much, Jinji. Um, your captions are absolutely beautiful and I'm so glad. Um, I have um, watched that Christine Sun Kim video a few times now. I've been following her work for a while and I think her work is just absolutely beautiful. So I'm really glad that you took her work to heart. Um, I also have an individual question for Yeab. Um, Yeab, after interviewing the Black artists in your film, um, what personal reactions did you experience and how has it changed or affected you and your future plans? And this is from Gloria. Hi, thank you, Gloria. Um, personal reactions. I guess I saw how versatile a Black artist can be. Um, there is no one form. That's what I saw because, um, you know, there's certain things portrayed in the media and all of that. And um, that's not it. The, the story is much, much bigger. So I got to hear um, from very different, different folks um, on a certain subject. So that was my personal reaction. I heard things I didn't expect to hear, basically. Awesome, thank you so much, Yeah, um, Natasha, I have a question for you from Shauna. Um, how did you discover Recovery Cafe and what made you decide to make a film about it? Can you hear me? Okay. One of my best friends growing up with um, mental, with the mental, mental health awareness, mental health disabilities, her name is Sophia Wong. She told, she told me to take a rap class at, at Recovery Cafe as a wellness recovery action plan. And it's like a, um, a to-do list in case you get um, bombarded or like stood up or like freak out, freaking out. It's like, it's a toolkit. And when I was at Recovery Cafe, Sophia was there and we were like friends. And I decided to stay at Recovery Cafe because we had open mics and I was doing my Tai Chi. I do Tai Chi. And um, <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh. 
The secret to Omega, uh, to Recover Cafe is that it is exactly like Omega Institute for those studies, the my place that I was working before. And so I connected them two together and thought, they're allowing me to do Tai Chi in this open space. I'm like, I'm going to stay here a little more. But um, the holistic health department teaching you how to meditate and... Um, it's just great. So the person that got me there was Sophia Wong, and um, she's she's my best friend. And um, yeah, I'm totally grateful that Sophia Wong existed to tell me that. Okay. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, all right, I think we have time for one more question um, before we have to wrap up. Um, and this question comes from Elvis, um, and the question is for everyone. Um, how can we, the community, support you more? And I will pick Pamela, and we'll do popcorn style again. So, I, I mean, in terms of my film, what I was talking about was the lack of access to um, early care and education facilities that are of high quality and particularly to children of lower uh, income households. So the way that we can get activated about changing that is to engage with your elected officials, finding out who your city council representatives are, what districts you live in and figuring out how to reach your assembly members and your state senators and making sure that they are champions for child care and that they are thinking about children and the families of young children and that their policies are, are doing right by our families. So um, Parent Voices California, which is the website link there, is leading the charge on a very important piece of legislation. Um, next year, AB 192 is going to try to make child care more affordable, especially the families of middle income who have a hard time accessing child care because of um, just a lot of bureaucracy that I can't get into right now. Um, but following us on social media for our local efforts and following Parent Voices California mm -hmm. for the statewide efforts to learn how you can um, connect with the local leaders because these elected officials ultimately do have a big impact in how our dollars are spent and how our programs are run. And so if these folks aren't thinking about children, if we're, uh, then it's going to be, it's, I guess it's our job to tell them to think about children. So um, I will popcorn to Claudia. Um, I think how you can support the community is obviously paying attention to what we vote for um, having conversations. I think a lot of people, I learned in our documentary, I usually was thinking that it was the government officials that were against cruising and low riding culture, but it was actually our own community as well. And so making sure that we embrace and find different ways to not make this a crime, but perhaps um, just learning how to embrace different cultures and finding spaces for it because we don't always have the spaces but we have the desire and so i would think that's how you can help um i will pass it over to Jinji. thank you claudia um so yeah i think um uh, well first of all i'm drop our social media again we're on instagram as kuantang dialect um so the thing about Guangdong is that even though it's like this really old tradition that's been around for hundreds of years, uh, due to the legacy of colonization, it's so obscure that even if you ask other people in the Philippines about it, they're like, what's that? They don't know what it is. So, you know, if you can link us up with like other cultural groups, uh, shout out to Joyelle. She was asking about doing a cultural show in the future. Hopefully we can make that work. Um, letting us know about opportunities where I can perform, that would really help us out a lot. And let's see. Joyelle, have you gone yet? Sorry if you see me over here um, 
distracted looking feverishly typing answers to the, to the questions in the Q&A. But um, as far as how you could support um, the community more, um, two things come to mind. The first thing being uh, taking it upon yourself to, to dive into understanding who Africans are and that you are one of them. Um, and, and the second thing would be to to create spaces. Um, a lot of times um, we have conversations, like as, a, as somebody who is a part of a West African uh, drum and dance troupe, have conversations with people um, about how they can fit us into their, their program and their um, event or whatever. And, and it's oftentimes, you know, well, how does that relate to what we're doing? Um, but we're Africans. And so, you know, if you can see, if you can see the connection, um, it means that you're, you're doing your research and you're doing your part um, because, you know, that's, we all have to go back to root at some point. So creating spaces for us and understanding that, um, that we do have a place in San Jose and in a lot of the events and things like that that happen um, that you might not think, you know, why would Africans be here? Um, hopefully, you know, looking inward and, and doing some research to answer that question would be a great place to start to support the community. And I'm going to pass it to... I'm going to pass it to Eric. I don't know why that's so hard for me, but... <laughs> um, how you can support the, the artists, like the ones I interviewed. Um, honestly, just word of mouth, like being that bridge, like if you know someone with a business or you know someone that owns a building that, you know, that could use some, some love and some art, like it's always cool to patch over the two. So always like look for local artists out there to, to help uh, contribute because there's a lot that kind of get, they kind of go under the radar because they're not clicked up with like these, these like clicky little like art collectives in San Jose that we kind of have right now. It's like some kind of just do their own thing and they're not really like that social or like they don't like just like not the one trying to keep the just, like mooch off like the art collectors, you know, because they kind of give they give their friends like the the jobs and stuff a lot in, in the city. And there's a lot of artists out there that's kind of just that go unseen with a lot of talent. So you guys know anyone that needs a mural, yeah, let me know and I can let some people know and I can make it work. But uh, um I think that's it. I'm not sure if anyone else gone. Um um, Yayab and Natasha and Anne. Andrew, did you go? You got big fans you last. So we'll go with uh, Yayab. Okay, next. Thank you. Um, just emphasizing what everybody said, creating spaces for people to express themselves. Um, you don't have to understand it or relate to it. It's just creating spaces for people to be themselves and um, show their culture and who they are and i am going to pass it on to natasha yeah can you hear me okay well recovery cafe is it represents homelessness mental health issues addiction or to anybody who seeks counseling and what it is it's like it's like um no money to some money to I got money. I mean, no money. There's people with no money and be like, okay, so what can we do? And we can learn more positive mantras like and resources um, to say, hey, this is where you can take a shower or here we got resources for you. So, we, uh, so be a resource for us. And... Um, Something that I would like to add is that Recovery Cafe does hold open mics and does hold holiday parties and does hold health fairs. You get an SED check, get AIDS check, you get you get tested out, you get um, you get flu shots. So it's very it's very fun if you're a member. And what I guess I could want from us is to have super prom like in high school, like you have to go to prom. 
I guess that's what, what fills um, full self-esteem. So I wish we could cafe got more uh, more dance more dance days and like to to dance music and it'd be so fun, you know, like the the whole cafeteria would be like this prom. That'd be so cool to have one day. But to but for everybody, um I guess that um yeah, it's homelessness. Um can't afford a job to to pay the rent. Yes, um, addiction is schizophrenia, hearing voices, um, psychotic. I'd be like, dude, 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 psychotic. So teachers, we need more teachers to volunteer on these things called schizophrenia because it's, it's intense. I mean, the superheroes, those are people, and I'm like, Okay, so what you can give to Recovery Cafe, be a mentor, give them money, give them food, give them crayons, and give us a PlayStation, like um, video games, but um, positive mantras and resources. Thanks. Thank you so much. Did anyone not have a chance to answer the question? Did, did Andrew go? Um, I don't believe Andrew, but I don't see him in the um, in the panelists. I wonder if his internet cut out. Um, well, with that, thank you everyone so much for all of your thoughtful questions. Um, we love all of the engagement in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, if you didn't have your question answered, please check out the Q&A box um, and look in the answered section. Um, the filmmakers have been um, typing answers to all the questions that we, we didn't have time to get to. Uh, but I just wanted to thank everyone again for their, their really thoughtful questions um, and bringing such um, engaging and interesting questions to this conversation. Um, I also want to thank all of our filmmakers for um, all of their thoughtful and wonderful answers and their hard work. Um, I hope that you all feel super proud of the work that you've done. It's really incredible. And I have just been super honored to be able to, to watch you all grow throughout this process and now to be able to share your work with everyone. Um, with that, I am going to pass it off to Chad, who's going to say a couple words uh, before we wrap up our event for today. Thank you all. I, I, just, thanks for joining us. But really, I, I really want to thank the, the participants and the filmmakers. You, you all have worked really hard, and I've been doing this for almost twenty years. And today, uh, I was seriously blown away. So thank you all for all you did, um, and will continue to do. And obviously, I want to thank the staff and and intern mentors. You don't do this work without mentorship. I mean, it's scary and hard to tell a story that you're passionate about. And many of you are new storytellers and probably some of you thought you could never make media this way. And so uh, just thanks. Thanks to uh, Malcolm and Francesca and interns and staff. You know, one of our goals is to create a more equitable and just media system. And, and when I watch these stories, I'm like, y'all should be in charge of the studios and Netflix, right? I mean, <laughs> these these are the kinds of stories and perspectives we should see in the media. And and these stories in particular help shape our city's identity. And, and these are stories you're not going to see anywhere else. Uh, and while some of you might go on to making more films, which would be amazing, and I hope we can support you along that journey, I think all of y'all are going to make a difference in our community. And I think ultimately... Creativity wants to use media and technology to create a, a community of change makers. And I think all y'all uh, are leaving with a new sense of power. And to me, that's the most important part of this program and the work we do. Um, and ultimately that, that's what equity and justice are, right? It's shifting a person's power and their ability to make the world a better place. So thank you all for being on this journey with us and I can't wait to work with you more and see what you all do. As always, thanks to the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and the National Endowment for Arts for making this possible. 
And thanks to all of you who joined us um, and that are going to watch this later and supporting Create TV San Jose. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. Yeah. So once again, we want to thank you all for being here. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, Eduardo, who had to leave a little bit early, but Eduardo was another participant who runs his own business and actually followed his sister who runs her own business as well. Um, he was unable to, to give us the documentary because he had to work, but we will, we will be posting that very soon. And I just want to one more time shout out everybody's groups and everybody's businesses. So shout out, like, Eduardo has a business called Value Meals. So if you want some good, healthy, clean food, he delivers, he cooks he cooks meals and delivers them to you. I want to, like, shout out to Nero Bay Area. Shout out to Kulintang Dialect. Shout out to Condemned Poets, you know. And, and I think that's all the ones that I had uh, written down, so. Thank you very much, y'all. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna um you don't have to you don't have to go home, but you know the rest of that statement for our participants. If you would like to uh you know stay to debrief, we'll we'll keep it open, we'll keep the zoom open for a little bit longer so that we can debrief. But other than that, thank you so much for the attendees that came. I seen Keith was in the building, my dad's in the building, Melody was in the building. I seen we had Gabrielle in the building, who was an OG, a D, not only a DMM OG, but just a, a, a activist OG. You look up her name, you will you'll see. Um, thanks for uh, James who came in, and asked a bunch of questions, and then James Harris from La who was running DMM last year. Um, really blessed and honored to be able to share it with everybody. So, peace and blessings. <laughs>